We are now five seasons and 52 episodes deep into Solar Opposites, and obviously alongside those lovable alien sitcom hijinks, we have continued to get more and more Tales from the Wall, or now, after season five, The Backyard. A couple years ago, I did a big recap analysis of the entire Wall story from seasons one through three. People seem to really enjoy it, and many have asked me to update it with the latest two seasons as well, and so, here I am. The first part of this video will be mostly that previous video, and then on the back end, I'll be adding analysis for seasons four and five, as well as some speculation about what we might expect from season six and beyond. So join me for five seasons worth of breakdown analysis for Solar Polar Opposites, The Wall. Hey, this video is brought to you by two things today. One is my official compilation channel, Johnny Too Cozy, where I'm re-editing tons of my old videos into themed compilations, long videos that are great for sleeping or drawing. And second, my wonderful patrons who get tons of extra content exclusive to Patreon. We're currently in the middle of season two of our BoJack Horseman audio commentaries. Check those out if they interest you. Thank you so much for your support. I couldn't do it without viewers like you. So before we get into the specifics, I want to talk broadly about why I've grown to love The Wall as a Solar Opposites subplot. Solar Opposites is a show that, while it does have its own lore and is starting to introduce more serialized aspects, largely remains a very silly sitcom parody that operates episodically. And I love that about it. But as the show is a more episodic sitcom, it does generally adhere to a status quo. But with the introduction of the Wall subplot, the series is actually able to tell a tangential, serialized storyline that can actually take risks with its characters and narratives. It's an incredible instance of a show having its cake and eating it too. And it's not like they take the wall for granted either. They have incredible voice talent throughout with the voices of Andy Daly, Christina Hendricks, Sterling K. Brown, and Alfred freaking Molina. I mean, my god. And while I have often thought, wow, they should just spin the wall off into its own show entirely, I kind of love the way that it occasionally intersects with the solar opposites. The way the wall was slowly introduced is honestly pretty genius. The very first episode introduces the shrink ray as Yumulak and Jesse use it on a school bully, but it isn't until the very end of the episode that they properly introduce the actual wall, at least from the outside. From now on, we only shrink adults. No one cares when some jerk goes missing. Good night, Mr. Janitor. This starts as a pretty fun and out there reveal, but I don't think many people had any real idea how far they would go with it. The introduction of the concept is one thing, but episode two takes it a whole step further, making the conflict of the subplot about Yumulak's people shrinking habits. For the last couple months, you've been putting way too many people in the wall. But it also establishes a lot that would come into play later, like the fact that Jesse feels for the wall people and gifts them their candy. But this episode actually nonchalantly introduces one of the most important characters in all of the wall, Tim. So from now on, I'll make sure that everyone in the wall deserves to be- Oh, a guy in a red shirt! I just love how the end of this episode reveals that the wall isn't just some device for Yumulak's growth as a character, it's an entire world. After Tim gets dumped into the wall, we immediately see the reality of the situation. There are gangs willing to kill so they can pillage anything new shoved into the wall. Resources are scarce, and the wall is dangerous. One episode later, we actually get to explore this world, and the world building within the wall is like I said before, it's genius. Another of the main wall characters, Sherry, is introduced and thrown into the wall, and Tim quickly comes to help her, now a battle-tested wall survivor. Come with me if you want to live. That's from Predator. It's from the Terminator. I can't get over how effectively they begin to introduce the world within the wall. Tim immediately explains that the Enforcers are a martial police led by the Duke, the leader of the wall. It's pretty complicated. Is he like the Duke of New York from Escape from New York? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's exactly like that. Oh, I forgot about that movie. But this first real episode set inside the wall perfectly illustrates the complexities and genius of the world building. The way the Duke seizes resources to maintain control and power. The way the limited resources make certain things as valuable as gold. How the persistent dialogue diet of candy might last a while, but the lack of nutrition has severe and negative effects on the people, particularly someone who has diabetes. There are even religions developed that worship Jesse, as she's the one who gifts the wall with resources persistently. And of course, the general aesthetic of this amazing world that's built around discarded junk, all used to build buildings, furniture, tools, etc. It's just such a wildly creative world. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids meets Escape from New York meets Snowpiercer. And this also properly introduces the dangers and stakes 
weeks of living in the wall as Pedro tries desperately to get his father some insulin for his diabetes. They start with a piece of Slim Jim, protein being one of the most valuable commodities in the wall. They then try to trade that for a Playboy magazine, which, you know, that makes sense, porn always sells. But when it's refused, Pedro steals the magazine to trade to the Duke anyways, starting a riot. And we later learn that this riot spread to three different levels of the wall, causing chaos and revealing how volatile the society within can be. And this also dooms Pedro, who is then punished for causing the riots. God, even just the creativity of using a floss pick as such a brutal weapon is wild. But this episode perfectly establishes what kind of a world the wall is. It hints at the types of creativity we're going to see throughout, and of course creates our two main characters' motivations as Tim and Sherry see the depths of corruption the Duke and his reign bring. I have to fix this place. How can one person change the world? by tearing it down. So after patiently introducing the concept in the first two episodes, this one gives us our first real in-wall story and shows us just how many possibilities there actually are for this subplot. Two episodes later, we return to the wall and see how the newly motivated Tim and Sherry are taking action against the Duke. After stealing info from one of the Duke's higher ranking officers, the ragtag crew has access to tons of secret locations. Food caches, secret passages, and ugh, he has his own personal 50s diner called Bop Bop. I love this sort of of insurrection storyline, where the hope is to redistribute the Duke's caches of resources to the rest of the wall. I think the other thing I love about this episode is that it's still wildly funny, even within the dramatic serialized wall storyline. This dude insists on sacrificing himself despite not being at all necessary, and when he's hit with this explosion that he easily could have avoided, it has majorly unfortunate effects. I'm blind and I have no dick! But the end of the episode reveals that they'd all been duped by the Duke. He set them up so he could take them out. Sherry gets kicked into the boohoo hole, which leads down to the lowermost parts of the wall and is presumed dead, while Tim is arrested and put on the Duke's prison level. This is where the wall plot gets kicked into high gear with an entire episode of Solar Opposites 100% dedicated to the wall. Even the music just feels bigger and more orchestral. It honestly reminds me of Lord of the Rings. It's an absolutely massive feeling story that takes place over a full 22 minute episode. Episode. And fittingly, the stakes are way higher, as they introduce other characters that you quickly grow to love, particularly this guy and his mouse, Molly. Oh, all right, Molly. I'm up. I'm up. You can't let me sleep in one day? You see so much more of the day-to-day -day in this episode, showing the people who thrive and the people who struggle under the Duke's rule. This poor guy barters using mouse milk thanks to Molly, but his new life in the wall is actually something he cherishes. It's funny to think that I used to be the CEO of AT&T. Back then, I thought money was everything. I actually really love the way they showcase that not everybody is unhappy in the wall. Here's a guy who farted in an elevator, blamed it on an alien kid, and was shrunk down and put in the wall. And it helped him realize what's actually important in his life. He's living a more fulfilling and happier life with this mouse Molly inside the wall than he ever did as a successful CEO on the outside. And now I know that it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Ultimately, the wall shows how dire circumstances can truly change a person. Some Sometimes for good, and sometimes not so much. Which brings us back to Tim. I love what they do with Tim in this episode. Now, in prison, he learns that his actions were a catalyst for a lot of resistance, and he takes the opportunity to start writing letters about what needs to change in the wall. So I'm letting go of the world outside the wall and choosing to embrace the world in it. A world we can make better. A world we will make better. And these letters, after being smuggled out of prison, start to inspire even more freedom fighters to push back against the Duke and his forces, effectively making Tim the de facto leader of the resistance and almost a messianic figure. We also find out that Sherry is alive. She breaks Tim out of prison and unites him with the forces he's destined to lead. And with his newfound influence, he opts to try and unite the lower and mid-levels of the wall so they can climb up and overthrow the Duke. The Duke forgot that he needs the people more than we need him. The one problem with this is that the Duke has the high ground and he's got contingencies for this very scenario. And I can't get over how creative this idea is. The Duke rigs multiple bottles of water so that he can flood the lower levels of the wall in case of an attack, which leads to, without a doubt, the saddest moment in not just the wall, but all of Solar Opposites, as Molly cannot make it out of the lower levels in time. Molly, no! <laughs> this shit is absolutely devastating. I cry every time I watch this. It fucks me up. And on top of that, we then see how many people are killed in the flood by the hands of the Duke, and it is 
bleak. Eventually, despite the carnage from the flood and countless obstacles in their way, Tim and Sherry do manage to reach the Duke's office and discover the truth. The Duke had a hole to the outside of the house, allowing him to smuggle resources in and out during his reign and allowing him to escape now. Sherry is ecstatic that they can now help the people escape the wall and try to find a way to get big again, but I think this particular claim is what brought Tim to an important realization. The resistance, the wall, none of it matters anymore. We have to tell the people. Even after accomplishing their entire goal, the thought of returning to his old life pushes Tim to make an unexpected decision in one of the strongest twists of the entire show. The wall is ours. The Duke is dead. What? We don't know that he's dead. And once again, life inside the wall has offered somebody a drastically different lifestyle, one that he is unwilling to give up. We don't know much about Tim's life outside of the wall, but inside the wall, he's a warrior, a freedom fighter, a leader, a hero, and basically a messiah. In the wall, Tim is important. And when Sherry told him that none of it mattered anymore, that made him think about all he'd be giving up if he returned to his life outside of the wall. If he returned to just being a regular guy, and Tim was not willing to give up his status and power in the wall. Some see it as our curse, but I see a gift. We can build a world that's better than the before for. And once again, Sherry falls to what should be her death into the backyard, ending season one's wall storyline. And in season two's second episode, we dive right back into the wall with some funny meta dialogue to lead us in. It's tired. Not to me. It's my favorite part of our whole thing. They had an awesome little war in there. But like I mentioned earlier, the wall is the part of Solar Opposites that changes up the status quo and serializes its world. When we go back into the wall, everything has changed. There's a greeter to meet new people who have been put in the wall, explaining the history of the wall that we saw in season one, as well as some things we know to be lies. We have many to thank for their sacrifices, but none more than Sherry, who lost her life slaying the Duke. Tim has basically made Sherry a martyr, even though he was the one who killed her. And though Tim basically became the new Duke, one thing is undeniable. The state of the wall has seemingly improved significantly, at least at a glance. There's actually plant life growing throughout. New wall folks are immediately asked what they most want to do with their lives. They're given housing. A nutritionist named Steve comes by to divvy out fresh fruit. Well, I grew them myself from seeds we pulled out of a kind bar. They just continue to expand the world building in natural and smart ways. And they introduce us to new characters too. The primary character for this season being Hulk Hogan, played by Sterling K. Brown. Hulk is seen as a war hero. During the events of the Battle for the Wall in Season 1, Hulk rescued countless people from under an avalanche of nerds, and now he's respected throughout the Wall as basically a veteran, even though in the Before 4, he was just a writer on bones. And we even see how the events of the war have affected these people. Hulk has regular PTSD episodes slashing back to the most traumatic moments during the Battle for the Wall. It's really impressive how they're not only brilliantly building the world of the Wall, but also evolving the world and its people based on the events of the previous season. But the reveal at the end of this first Wall story in season two reveals the truth. That beneath this gorgeous, idyllic version of the wall that appears to be utopic is something rotten, as the body of Steve the Nutritionist is discovered in a park having been brutally maimed and murdered. And I love this from both a narrative and thematic perspective, because while Tim replaced the Duke, at the core of the wall he kept the same pillars of government in place. He may have tidied up the place and given it a fresh coat of paint, but he didn't fundamentally change the reality, that the people are being lied to in order to keep them under control. And the next Wall episode highlights this really well as Tim's Walderman help investigate the murder with the help of Hulk because of his experience writing on Bones. For this entire storyline, it's clear that the Waldermen are either not good at their jobs or willfully sabotaging Hulk's plans. They're doing everything they can to convince Hulk that a rogue cricket is responsible, despite the incredibly elaborate display of entrails for each murder victim. To Hulk, it's clear that it's a serial killer. And this is the kind of story that I think The Wall instantly makes more interesting. It's such a different type of society, so seeing the way they might have to deal with grisly murders, even after it's transformed into this seemingly idyllic world, is super interesting. At first, it appears that the Waldermen are just completely inept, at one point murdering a suspect 
on site, but it later becomes clear that they're simply trying to derail the investigation so that it can close with a satisfactory conclusion. But despite these attempts, Halk discovers the real culprit and over the next episode discovers the worst truths about the wall and his own past. The psychopath who's been murdering innocent wall citizens actually caused the massive nerd avalanche that turned Halk into a hero. It was his attempt to kill himself and end his murderous impulses, but Halk saved him. That's when I knew I was special. You saved me so I could fulfill my destiny. <laughs> I'm a god. Shut up. I appreciate these kinds of character revelations. Here's a guy who already has PTSD from the war on the wall. The events of the nerd avalanche haunt him over and over throughout the season, but he was able to hone in on the simple fact that he did the right thing and he saved people's lives. But now he's learned that by saving one of these people, he's doomed others. He saved someone who murdered other people. He created a monster. It's just really good, fascinating personal drama for Halk, a brutal challenge built around his own traumas. And Halk is a character who believes in what the wall had become. He believes in Tim, and this murderer is now challenging his notions and expectations by making claims that we as the audience know to be true. We know there's a hole in the wall. We know Tim isn't the great perfect leader he's seen as, but Halk can't accept this easily because he has so many personal stakes embedded in the events of the war for the wall. There's no hole in the wall, and I won't let you drag Tim's good name. This is the episode where we get our first real look at Tim since the events of season one, and honestly, I think the character work they do is impressive. He's not exactly like the Duke. He doesn't reign with an iron fist and brute force. He's manipulative. He feigns empathy to gain your trust and convince you that what he wants is what you want too, and is what's best for everyone. Tim reveals so much of the truth to Halk, he even shows him the hole. He admits to Halk that he's been a bad leader and didn't change enough about the way it was overseen. I should have never kept the Duke's enforcers in power. All I did was change their name to the Walderman. But he doesn't tell him the entire truth. He lies about Sherry's motivation. She started talking crazy. She wants to force people out into the backyard to let them get eaten by owls. And of course, he downplays his own crimes, making it seem like he had no choice. She fought me. And I killed Sherry. I killed the love of my life to save us all. And this is really the core of Tim's manipulation. He actually gives Halk the choice to reveal the truth to everyone, or to help him maintain the lie that seemingly allows for peace in the wall to continue. But he gives him that choice with misinformation about the realities of his own crimes and motivations. He makes Halk think it's the only real choice for prolonged peace, which leads him to become a part of Tim's lies. We captured the murderer. It was a rogue cricket. And it's all revealed on the day dedicated to Sherry, who is heralded as a hero for killing the Duke. But this season's big epic wall episode brings back Sherry in a huge way, and I think adds a ton of fascinating nuance to the character dynamics and relationships. We jump back an entire year and see Sherry's life after the events of the season one finale. She survives the fallout of the hole and spends an entire year in the backyard. And this fully feels like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids territory in a great way. It just expands the danger and suspense for these tiny people. Bugs, birds, and possums become massive monsters. A small yard becomes a massive journey. But the most interesting aspect of this episode is how they tie the Duke back in. Sherry and the Duke are now the only two tiny people in the backyard, and they're effectively trapped together in this alien vs. predator requiem ship toy. And over the course of the year they spend together in the yard, surviving and helping each other against the possum, they slowly become actual friends. I found this aspect super interesting, because obviously personal experience goes a long way, and over the course of this year, the Duke does a lot for Sherry, but she effectively forgets about the Duke's crimes. We saw the man murder countless people in the previous season, and we'll talk more about this in season three, but she continues to harbor her grudge against Tim, which obviously feels more personal given that he stabbed her and threw her into the backyard. But I don't think we can say Tim is any worse than the Duke as a leader. We've seen Tim kill people, but we've never seen Tim flood the wall and mass murder people. It's just fascinating to see what people are willing to hold on to or forgive throughout these dire situations. Though the Duke does sacrifice his life to save Sherry in the end, and that is a pretty massive gesture. The other massive revelation is that Sherry is pregnant with Tim's child and has to go through her entire pregnancy inside of the AVP spaceship. 
This leads Sherry to have to make a really tough decision. Do they make the trek back to the wall or do they try for the Walgreens over the fence to seek help? Go back to the place you know is dangerous or take a chance on something completely unknown. After the Duke's sacrifice to help Sherry escape the possum, Sherry has to make this long, perilous journey on her own. I love how massive they make the yard through this and how dangerous nearly everything feels. The sequence where she actually gives birth is so ridiculously suspenseful, but in such a fun way. And also showcases one of the cool moments where the wall story intersects directly with the solar opposites. Sherry is stuck in the Pez dispenser as Jesse eats Pez one by one, getting closer and closer to Sherry herself as she's giving birth. Just such a creative location for this kind of drama and suspense, and it would have been suspenseful without Sherry giving birth. It adds a whole extra layer of suspense. And Sherry ends up needing to make two entire journeys because she discovers that the Walgreens was just a billboard. And she has to return all the way to the wall with her baby Pesley in tow. And she ends up returning to the wall on Sherry Day of all days, just in time to see Hulk's cricket speech that we saw a few episodes earlier. This last scene basically merges our season one and season two wall stories together and sets the stage for season three as Sherry and Hulk join forces to undermine Tim's regime. I love that this season's big wall episode actually takes place almost entirely outside the wall. It builds up Sherry as a character even more thoroughly than season one did and also humanizes the Duke in a way I didn't expect was possible after his actions in the first season. Now, it doesn't excuse or justify anything he did, of course, but this entire wall subplot through all three seasons just does some fascinating character work through the stressful and hard to comprehend events they're put through. These scenarios see good men find power and become corrupt, like Tim. It sees corrupt men lose their power and become selfless, like the Duke. It sees the greedy CEO of AT&T become a humble mouse milk trader, lose the mouse he loves, and then become, well, we'll get to that soon. Season 3 ramps up the Wall storyline in unexpected ways. We do get one episode that focuses almost entirely on the Wall characters once again, but this time it's earlier in the season and features an incredibly subversive storyline. But in the second episode of Season 3, they really just get right into the action. Sherry and Halk immediately attempt to sneak up to Tim's office and take him out, and as you might expect, Sherry's grudge is fully personal. I need to see the look in Tim's eyes when he sees that I'm alive, and I'm exposing him for the fraud he is. This is once again filled with some absolutely genius writing for the shrunk down world. Tim now uses a Gen 5 Furby as a security system. Gen 5 Furby. Motion sense is better than the Pentagon's. And then the fun immediate twist, Tim has gone absolutely mad, hallucinating, detached from reality, all because he's drinking water out of a 1983 Burger King glass that's colored with lead paint. I think Sherry's reaction to this is really interesting. They realize that Tim isn't likely to survive the lead poisoning, which would accomplish their goal, get him out of power. But Sherry isn't satisfied with that. She wants him to be cognizant of his own downfall. She wants him to face justice. But to me, it feels a bit more like revenge. So they actually try to save Tim's life so that he can face a proper punishment. He looks like he has lead poisoning from some kind of fast food novelty glass. She's good. And this leads to one of the most interesting character studies in the entire show, in addition to one of the most brilliant and subversive pieces of storytelling in general. The next episode opens with Tim waking up seemingly healthy again, equipped with a plan to escape the wall while the aliens are all at Hulu land. The entire episode is this massive redemption for Tim as he escapes the wall with Sherry close behind, untrinks them both, and they attempt to find a way to bring the solar opposites to justice and rescue the wall people. Tim even confesses his deepest feelings of regret and love for Sherry. My life is richer, happier, and better because you are in it. And while I hate the wall more than anything, I also kind of love it because it gave me you. The pair of them team up, discover that the aliens have government immunity because they share their technology, and then are forced to just go back to their everyday lives and forget about the wall. They eventually, of course, decide that they have to go back. We have to go back. We have to go back! And manage to overpower the aliens and rescue everyone in the wall. But here's the thing. This entire episode feels off. There are so many aspects of this story that don't track, and other parts that feel contrived. And that's because the end of this episode reveals that this was all Tim's death experience. Tim's desperation to maintain his good name and be a hero bled into his dying thoughts, and he concocted this entire scenario made up of movie cliches and ego-building moments. There are even lines that are pulled directly from movies. Forget it, Tim. It's Hulu land. 
forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. I mean, the idea that Sherry would forgive Tim so easily after simply confessing his love for her? Complete nonsense that could only exist in Tim's head. Sherry doesn't seem concerned about the child she left behind in the wall because Tim doesn't know about the child. Yumulak raving about how much he loved watching Tim's adventures and rise to power in the wall like it was a TV show he was watching. There are so many clever hints that this is just Tim's desperate hopes for redemption as he lay dying of lead poisoning. And the fact that The Wall, the show within the show, is now able to give us subversive episodes that take place entirely within one character's mind is so impressive to me. On paper, it might seem like a waste to spend the precious little time we spend each season on wall plot on something that never actually happened, but the episode is so enjoyable and entertains so many interesting ideas, all while wrapping up Tim's story in a way that is entirely built around his journey as a character. And I think it's the perfect culmination of his story. Over the course of season one, Tim's rise to a messianic figure made him egocentric, and though I don't think he was deserving of redemption, it did seem like his appearances in season two showcased genuine remorse and regret over what he did to Sherry, even if he wasn't willing to accept the consequences. So this fever dream of a resolution for Tim makes so much sense. It's everything he wanted rolled into one. He maintains his heroic visage, literally saves the entire wall from the aliens, shrinks them down and punishes them for what they did to him. He makes amends with Sherry and she forgives him. Everything goes perfectly, like a movie within a show within a show. But of course, it wasn't real, because how could it be? It was just the fleeting desires of a dying man who made horrible, selfish decisions. And I think killing Tim is such an interesting move for the narrative of the wall in general, especially given how things go from here. Tim wasn't actually known as a bad leader. He was beloved and respected by the residents of the wall. So usurping his leadership was a risky move. I wanted him to pay for his crimes, but of course he dodged that, just like he always does. <laughs> and it's very clear in the follow-up that this power vacuum is a problem. The church's plan is to put Sherry in the new leadership role, but Sherry knows this would just maintain the same cycle. They even wanted to call her the Duchess, and I think this was a big hint for what was to come. Because the problem here is that they still didn't rid the wall of all of the powers that held up the previous regimes. They were too trusting of the Bowenian church, who were around for both the Duke and Tim's reigns. They were a vital pillar in upholding that status quo. And Sherry comes along and decides to drastically shake up that status quo by revealing the truth instead of accepting a role as a leader. There is a hole in the back of the wall. No, no not like this. So two things are made clear here. Sherry is a different type of leader who wants full transparency with the wall citizens, and the Bowenian church does not want that. And even after Sherry shows everyone the hole and reveals the truth, the church tries desperately to spin this into to making her the new leader once again. But Sherry refuses. She wants the wall to be democratically governed. She wants people to be able to leave the wall if they want, despite the danger outside. It has to be their decision. She wants to remove the overt control from the leadership of the wall. Those who choose to stay are going to build a better world. No one person is going to save us. We're going to save each other. And for the first time, the government of the wall is chosen by the people with equal representation from all levels. And they're immediately tasked with their first major disaster. The power to the entire wall is cut. Sherry leaves Pesley with the Bohemian Church as she, Halk, and their team head to try and fix the problem in the lower levels. The next few episodes explore the wall in such a fun and new way as the team needs to descend to the lowest levels of the wall, which are now hugely dangerous because of the events of the season one flood. And the world building and evolution of the wall is such a highlight here. We meet terrifying sewer dwelling cannibals, and even more terrifying, the introduction of mosquitoes and mosquito larvae who can drain a tiny human's blood in a single suck. We even see locations from season one like the prison level and the Seinfeld set, now dank and disgusting from the flood, and of course, filled with monsters. And I think what I love most about this storyline is though we are cheering for and supporting Sherry as a character, I definitely wasn't sure if she was doing the right thing. They meet the janitor, the very first guy that we saw the kids put into the wall back in season one, and he's figured out how to harvest the mosquitoes and mosquito larvae for protein. Such a smart concept. But Sherry is so terrified of the dangers that the mosquitoes pose to her child, she isn't willing to go on without trying to kill them all, even if that means eliminating one of the most surefire ways to create a consistent food and protein source for the entire wall that they've ever had. So she and Halk attempt to destroy the mosquito hive. And then we meet back up 
with the poor mouse milkman, whose name we never really even learned, by the way. And I think this is still one of the saddest journeys in the show, because now after losing Molly, he's been entirely driven by revenge. He created an army of insects and he controls them by blowing through the skull of a dead mosquito. And I think this is really fascinating, because looking at the events of season one, it felt like Tim and Sherry and the rest of the wall were doing the right thing. They started the war to fight for the marginalized within the mall and bring a more balanced society to everybody. But in doing what they felt was the right thing, people were hurt including this guy, as he devastatingly lost his mouse Molly. Doing the right thing hurt innocent people and created a new monster for them to have to deal with later. Not unlike Halk had to deal with the serial killer in season 2. The action in this final sequence is wildly cool. Unfortunately, the mouse milk guy bites it pretty hard, and seemingly so does Halk. That being said, he falls down the boohoo hole fighting the Queen Mosquito, not unlike Gandalf fighting the Balrog in Lord of the Rings, which makes me think he may survive the fall. Only time will tell, but for now we don't know. And that leaves us with our season 3 cliffhanger, which I alluded to earlier. Because the last vestige of the Duke and Tim regimes made a power play while they still had the chance. Sherry returns to see that the Bowenian Church has announced that Pesley is effectively the Wall's new messiah. Our sweet Jesse has gifted us the sweetest candy of all! And this is, once again, another means of control. The church will use this new baby and assert their will upon the people, using her as their mascot and excuse. And this leads brilliantly into season four, as after the Duke and Tim's reigns begins the Bowenian Church, led by Sister Sisto. The ways the wall not only showcases these power vacuums, but the different ways that those vacuums can be filled is so fascinating, this time taking advantage of people's faith. As season four begins, we learn that the Bowenian Church has divided the wall with, fittingly, a wall within the wall, splitting the Bowenian churchgoers from the non-believers. On one side, the church reigns, with Pesley, aka Jesseus, as their hostage messiah. On the other side, Sherry's democratic council still in charge. But before we get into the major conflict, we meet this humble crazen farmer, who through his farming discovers a terrible reality about the wall itself. It's getting colder in the wall! This first story is focused on this man believing he's doing the right thing, attempting to warn Sister Sisto and save the wall, but we quickly see that bizarre propaganda spreads wildly around this side of the wall, with countless Bowenians believing that the other side of the wall is filled with these evil heathens. No, the heathens aren't coming over to stick their penises in our ears. We're also introduced to Montez, who seems to be the Bowenian church's most important warrior, upholding the church's control, threatening anyone who goes against their teachings, including this poor guy. Don't ever speak a word of this again, or you'll end up right here! But there are also hints that, despite his loyalty, Montez disapproves of some of Sisto's actions, particularly when she puts poor Pesley in a mouse trap cage like an animal. I also love how this whole the wall is getting colder plotline is effectively a stand-in for climate change denial within the wall, though before long we learn the truth behind this phenomenon, and as is usually the case within the wall, it is all about control. Those dummies will believe anything, and now I'm going to tell them Jessie is making it colder because she's punishing the right side for their godlessness. As usual, the evil leadership within the wall is made up of people who were once guided by righteousness, only to succumb to the allure of power. But one of the best things about this show is the inverse can be true as well. Characters who appear to primarily be interested in holding a position of authority may have righteous motivations. And this season, this is true of Montez, who laments that he killed the poor whistleblower as he sends a secret message over to the other side of the wall, revealing that he is a mole. It's one of the things that makes this entire story so compelling. The wall is this chaotic, desperate place. Everyone is in close quarters and peace is delicate, which makes Sherry's journey this season all the more fascinating. Whereas the last two seasons, we saw her desperate to ensure that the wall is fairly run by the people in a democratic fashion, she now finds herself at odds with that very government she helped install. As she is desperate to get her daughter back from the Bowenians, the council isn't as interested. Right now, we have peace. We can't jeopardize that by invading the Bowenian side. Obviously, Sherry has personal stakes this season, with Pesley being held hostage and toyed as the Bowenian messiah, and her desperation to get her back conflicts with the very thing that she insisted was most important for peace within the wall, a fair and democratically run government. We can vote on whether to send people to rescue Pesley. All in favor? 
Motion fails. And so we start to see Sherry make selfish moves to do right by her daughter, which I think are very understandable motivations. But they also start to show cracks in her belief system a little bit. Like we saw when she seemingly wanted revenge on Tim more than she wanted peace in the wall. Sherry shows severe paranoia, believing another council member, Jimmy, to be betraying their side of the wall. And when she's proven wrong, she takes drastic measures. She secretly destroys the only source of heat they have, making the threat of the wall getting colder much more imminent. This ends up sending her, Jimmy, and Lynette to the other side to try and rescue Pesley and fix the air conditioning. I just love the way that the wall tests the resolve of everybody in it. Even those with the most resolute beliefs are whittled down by their fears and insecurities. And having been following and believing in Sherry since season one, her journey is certainly the most compelling. Insisting they're doing the right thing for everybody, when in reality, she is helping herself. The next time we catch up with the wall, the trio has been undercover for a month, and the AC unit has basically turned it into a frozen tundra. Such a smart idea to use the AC unit as a device to completely change the climate and terrain of the wall. A really fun way to add more variety into the wall storyline four seasons deep. It's also just a great, dire, potentially cataclysmic circumstance. Everybody's well-being is threatened. And we also see that Sister Sisto's lust for power is just moving beyond reason. She's even just full-on torturing people with no real purpose at this point. Sisto basically installed herself as a papal-type role, where she and only she can speak to Jesse, and therefore she is the only one with the true scriptures and teachings. But her plan finally starts to splinter when Sister Blista, who you might remember as Hulk's wife Nova, points out some inconsistencies. Jesse said all who eat green M&Ms will burn in hell, but last week she said all Bowenians must eat green M&Ms. I like the ways these stories can show how power can truly not just corrupt, but cloud judgment. Sister Blista literally could not have been a more devout acolyte of Sisto's teachings. And with this single question about those teachings, Sisto lashes out and starts to alienate even the people who follow her most closely. But it also sadly shows how far these devout followers may go to excuse this obvious and terrible behavior and corruption, as we'll get into more shortly. But Sisto has actually convinced Pornova that there's a way for her to bring Hulk back from the dead. Jesse has a ray! It can bring back anything from the dead! Sister Sister was seen it! Ho <laughs> ho, let's put a pin in that one. This season's biggest wall story culminates at a massive ceremony at the Ninja Turtles Donatello head. Sherry is intent on getting Pesley back, but as it turns out, Jimmy and Lynette's only intention was to assassinate Sister Sisto, even if it means Pesley dies with her. This is such a great way to escalate escalate the core conflict of this season. I think it's a pretty fair argument that eliminating Sisto would be a good thing for the wall, but Sherry is willing to put that aside for her personal stakes. She would never sacrifice her daughter, even if theoretically it's for the good of the entire wall. After Montez reveals himself to be the mole and to be loyal to Sherry, Jimmy and Lynette meet pretty brutal deaths and their assassination of Sister Sisto fails as Sherry and Montez both escape on tech decks. This is a very fun snowboarding sequence. <laughs> At this point, if the entire season has hasn't made it clear, Sherry's priority is the safety of her child. She may have had righteous ideas in the past for a fair and equitable wall, but after countless reigns of various dictators, how can you blame her for simply wanting to put her and her own daughter out of harm's way? But Sherry also recognizes that Sisto is once again another symptom, not the root cause of the issues. She is the third dictator-type ruler over the wall, and if she had been killed, that's just another power vacuum to fill. The sacrifice of Pesley would have been meaningful meaningless, the only way to keep her safe is to once again leave the wall, or so she believes. Though, maybe she should have heard her own words here. The power struggles never end! We'll get back to that. Sherry decides to leave the wall, and Sisto uses Pesley's capture as an excuse to decimate the other side, and complete her takeover. This is where we really see the level of Sisto's selfishness and delusion, sacrificing the majority of her own soldiers over the fields of razor blades, insisting that this is Jesse's will. No! Jesse spoke to me! She wants them all dead! I can sense Jesse's nearby. Sisto's end is one of the most poetic in this entire storyline. As they reach what they believe to be the final holdout of wall citizens, they walk into a trap, locking the remaining Bowenians in the leadership chamber, leaving them to freeze to death as they learn that the citizens have all fled the wall to the backyard. As Sisto selfishly finds a way out and flees the wall alone, followed closely by Sister Blista, Sisto is crushed to death by Jesse herself, accidentally. An actual Jesse ex Mahina. What's your name? Blist. I mean Nova. My name is Nova. God, I just 
Love what this sets up for the wall moving forward, establishing that many have left the wall to head for the backyard, but also that Nova's faith in Jesse has quite literally been rewarded. What could have and probably should have been a sign to turn away from the manipulative and dogmatic ways of the Boenian church with Sisto's corruption and downfall, Nova spoke to God herself, and she literally answered her prayers to fix the temperature in the wall. Like I said, Jesse X Mahina. And while maybe the entire history of the wall might suggest this is too optimistic. You hope that Nova's newfound faith and desire to build a better society does hold up. If they survive the backyard, they'll return to find the wall better than ever before. Because from now on, we build friendships instead of barriers. There is one reason I'm a little optimistic about Nova's version of the wall. For one, all of these people basically were just saved by divine intervention. They have all seen something amazing that may motivate them to keep that faith. And additionally, there are simply much fewer people to rope into this new society now that so many have left for the backyard. Feel the warm air, the wind of change that brings a new life for us all! And the reason I'm still speculating is because in season 5, we actually don't see the inside of the wall at all. Instead, the focus shifts to the newly founded settlements in the backyard. And I think that this was an incredibly smart decision narratively. They have managed to do so much to keep the wall in interesting location across four seasons, but expanding to the backyard, a location we've only really seen through Sherry and the Duke in season two, and showcasing how entire tiny societies might adapt to this new bigger location was such a breath of fresh air for the storyline. The resources and strategies to obtain those resources Resources change, the threats move beyond just the other people, roping in the critters and weather, but it also really shifts the vibe from this sort of post-apocalyptic escape from New York type thing into more of a western land of outlaws feeling. Even the simple idea of building these little societies out of the things tossed into the backyard really expands what we're seeing, showcasing three main settlements across the season. Gutterville, the first town in the backyard, Sandbox Town, and Basketballburg. Do you remember when Yummy like first left that basketball out here? What did I say? Somebody's gonna holler that thing out and start living in it. And also, in another move that I think spices up these wall storylines a bit for the new season, the backyard follows entirely new characters, primarily Sophia and Gavin. Sophia runs the birdhouse saloon with her uncle Oscar, and there's so much to love about the tiny design of this place. The bottle caps on screws for stools, the poker chips for tables, the barrel of monkeys as a booze barrel, the stamp as giant wall art. You can even see a mosquito skull hanging on the wall, something we first saw in the season three mosquito plotline. But though the backyard doesn't present the same exact challenges that the wall did, it certainly isn't all that much easier. Rather than one place with tons of people vying for power, you sort of see people try and stake their power claims in multiple locations. Gutterville seems to be mostly peaceful, but Sandbox Town and Basketballburg both have their own unique hierarchies. Gavin traverses the backyard on his trusty hedgehog, and after overhearing Oscar offer a cross-yard food runner 10,000 yard bucks for a job, Gavin does everything he can to endear himself to Oscar so he can get the gig. I love how immediately they differentiate the vibe and tone of the backyard with the wall. New motivations, new ways to traverse, new terrain to cross, new struggles. It isn't until Oscar learns that Gavin owes somebody 10,000 yard bucks himself that he actually trusts him, ironically enough, recognizing that he's desperate enough to get the job done. But after he hires him and before Gavin sets off, Oscar is brutally murdered by a bounty hunter on a floppy lizard, leading Sophia to stow away on the cart that Gavin has been hired to pull across the yard. It's a good setup with new archetypes, a troubled character who needs to do something righteous to get himself out of hot water, and a younger, less world-traveled character who is desperate to see more of that world despite not recognizing how dangerous it might be. Their first journey to Sandbox Town showcases these characters really well. Sophia nearly gets herself killed by a squirrel, not realizing that the lack of water in the yard has made the animals desperate and that her shiny earrings might attract predators. Gavin is harsh in his lesson, but as we'll see, it gets through when it matters most. But Sandbox Town is a fascinating settlement. It's basically this dude Anthony running a little hippie-ass village. He claims the only thing he wants is to clear the sandbox of all debris, with the final piece being this bottle of Maker's Mark whiskey. While Gavin lets his guard down around an old friend, Sophia sees through his BS and learns that he's been using magic mushrooms to drug his community, and he really only has one motivation. When I get that whiskey, I'm going to corner the market on booze in the backyard. One of the things I really love about the backyard is 
that it seems to allow for so many more ways to attain power. Anthony, of course, wants status and power, but he isn't looking to be the leader or dictator. He just wants to be the one person to have access to one of the hottest commodities in the entire yard, booze. And it's not the only hot commodity. Before leaving Sandbox Town, Sophia manages to trick Anthony into luring a squirrel who attacks Tony and ends up ruining their excavation, burying him with his bottle. Another poetic end, as Sophia proves herself to Gavin. And funny enough, Sophia's drive to make sure the hippie commune knew that they were being drugged and that their worshipping of the sand was kind of a ruse was irrelevant in the end. They still decided to keep doing mushrooms and worshipping the sand. Uh, I guess we all have to find some way to be happy. But it isn't before long that Gavin learns the truth about Sophia and their quote-unquote food run. Gavin opens up more to Sophia and how weary he is after all the conflict in the wall. He fought in World War I, he had an honest job in the Tim era, he was a smuggler during the Boinian reign. But Gavin is tired of the politics and power grabs. This is a simple yard. Look at us delivering fruit to hungry people, no politics. That's the way to live. They come across what appears to be a giant puddle of water, but is actually deadly hand sanitizer. And my god, they deliver the absolute meanest fake out. I really thought Hedgie was going to die an even worse death than poor Molly in season one, but they just wanted us to feel genuine fear. This also reveals the actual cargo was never the food. It was the spigot hidden in the cart, the faucet that would provide water to the entire yard, allow fruit to grow again, helping everyone thrive. But Gavin sees this as more ploys for power, more politics, and he abandons Sophia. After which, she's captured by the bounty hunter, Little Richard, and is taken to Basketball Burg where it's revealed that Albert, the former head of the war console in the wall, has been collecting the spigots for himself. His plan is to control the access to the water in the entire yard so he can jumpstart an economy with yard bucks, an economy that he would be on top of. You were one of the good guys. I still am a good guy. This is such a vital aspect of these wall stories. Basically, every single character who has succumbed to a lust for power was once on the quote-unquote good side. Even people who are seemingly the most righteous bend their code of ethics, whether it's for deeply personal reasons or simply because they see an opportunity. And that leads pretty effectively into Sherry's story, a character who has very thoroughly bent her code of ethics to keep her daughter safe, retreating to this puddle oasis with Montez instead of continuing to help the people who actually needed across the yard and back in the wall. What if people out there are suffering? You're a good man, but protecting Pesley is what's important now. Fuck everybody else. I think this story has done such an effective job showcasing how Sherry fell down this path. How she went from fighting against tyranny, trying to instill an equitable and fair society, to letting fear lead her into selfish behavior, and eventually to, well, we'll get there soon. As it turns out, Montez was the one who was trying to get the spigot to help the yard, and when he learns what happened, he and Gavin try to go help Sophia and Basketballberg during their first ever yards fair. Sophia and Mia, who you might recognize as the introductory secretary in the Tim era in season two, and also from the war council in season four, managed to smuggle a spigot into a hot air balloon to escape basketball bird. Gavin's rescue attempt and Sophia's escape attempt basically coalesce into a giant clusterfuck, and Albert is basically abandoned and betrayed by his own people over the very yard bucks that he made so valuable. Again with the poetic failures these wall stories. This year, our solar ex mahina is Terry fixing the burnt backyard with his make alive ray, coinciding with probably the most most important Sherry development in the entire show. I've been running away from my destiny for too long. After refusing to take leadership for herself so many times, refusing to be the Duchess, after desperately attempting to install a fair and democratic body of government, after saving the wall over and over again, and leading the great exodus into the backyard, Sherry has decided that as she said last season, the power struggle never ends. If she wants that power vacuum to stop appearing, she has to fill it herself. You don't need a hero. What the wall needs is a queen. Like I said before, the story does such an eloquent job showcasing how Sherry got to this place, how she did literally everything she could to try and make the wall better and then slowly let fear seep into her decision making. But I think one of the vital aspects of Sherry's current rise to power is that it's now happening alongside this revitalization of the backyard from the Make Alive Ray. This means Sherry's reign will begin with unprecedented growth and prosperity. I think Sherry's reclamation of leadership will be seen as divine 
dying, and I think the expansion of the society in the backyard is going to be particularly significant in her era. But hiccups might come with this final reveal. The Make Alive Ray also revived the Duke, though he seems to not have any recollection of who he is. I don't know if this means Tim will become alive again. Tim's body was burned, but it also was in the backyard. It remains to be seen if this Ray can put those ashes back together. For now, I think we should just assume we're getting the Duke. But the revival of these former dictators is going to be significant, especially because of how the Duke's relationship with the people ended drastically differently than his relationship with Sherry. He proved himself to Sherry, and they became close friends. He sacrificed himself for her. But to the people, he is a bloodthirsty, evil, tyrannical warlord, who Sherry allegedly killed. And when they meet face to face, all of these confusing aspects of the optics of their relationship will probably come into play. The people will believe the story of Sherry killing the Duke was a lie, or if she shows mercy to the man who saved her, she will be seen as a queen who is aligning herself with this former evil man. In addition to this, we have not seen how Nova's version of the wall is progressing, how her new friendship-centric, faith-based utopia is coming along, the one that's ready to welcome the people of the backyard back into the wall with open arms, or perhaps how that society is not progressing, I guess we'll see. But how these two societies intermingle or conflict with each other will certainly be fascinating. But also, can we talk about how Nova was told that there is a Make Alive Ray that she can use to bring Hulk back, and it turns out there actually is? I think we should maybe expect that Nova's resolve in her fair leadership might falter if it means she can bring Hulk back from the dead. That has got to be a major plot point in the future. Regardless, the wall is still operating on another level. I've seen some people say they're getting tired of it, but I cannot agree. They're just so good at keeping it fresh and evolving the circumstances in new ways. The show has been renewed for a sixth season as well, and honestly, I hope more beyond that. But Mike McMahon has hinted that the season six wall story is the best yet. And at this point, I fully believe him. And that is where we are with the wall slash backyard. How do y'all like the story now five seasons in? Do you like the shift into the yard? Let me know below in the comments and I'll catch you next time. Peace. I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny two cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.